Um, nice to see everybody, uh, albeit by Zoom once again. It'll be fun once we can get get back in the same room, I think. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, uh, today, uh, we're just going to have an informational hearing only uh, where we want to talk about uh, driver's license testing stations throughout the state of Minnesota. Um, many of us in the Senate have received complaints about the fact that testing stations are still closed and the uh, perceived uh, slow reopening of the various or the, the 93 testing stations uh, that uh, we had provided funding for. And we simply want to talk about it today and find out what is the status, what's the plan. And then, uh, so we're going to hear from some folks from uh, DPS, including Commissioner Harrington. And uh, then there are some uh, uh, folks from the private sector that are on your agenda that I will be calling on after uh, DPS has uh, given us their presentation. So with that, we're going to start with uh, Commissioner Harrington. Uh, Commissioner, uh, welcome to the committee. And uh, uh, please uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Chairman Newman, uh, members of the committee, thank you very much. My name is John Harrington. I'm the commissioner of the Department of Public Safety uh, and the Department of Vehicle Services is one of the divisions that uh, exists under uh, my watch. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank you for having us here today to talk about uh, the DVS reopening plan. Uh, I can assure you that the DVS reopening plan and the plan to reopen exam station is now uh, the top priority for DVS. Uh, I know you are, a, are very acutely aware that DVS has been working on more than just reopening exam stations. Uh, for the past two and a half years, DPS and DVS primary focus was on getting men drive right. Uh, and I would add that it was done on time and within budget uh, that we were given. Uh, that fix was and has been our goal. And as of Monday, October 4th, phase two of Minnesota Drive has gone live and has been running smoothly. Uh, as, as you can probably remember from our first conversation in your office, that's a very different launch than the one uh, that you described for me when I took, uh, took over this office. Uh, with the completion of phase two, uh, DVS is in one system. Uh, this system, as Rick King and others predicted, has proven to be an excellent solution uh, and puts us in a great place to be able to meet customer and stakeholder needs and to adapt to the changing needs uh, that we see in the future. I want you to know that I hear much as you do from people every week on a, a pretty wide variety of DVS topics. Uh, uh, Department of Vehicle Services oftentimes does come in for comment uh, and I do hear from folks. Uh, those folks include farmers who have been calling me about trying to figure out CDL tests for truck drivers so they can get their crops in and uh, calls from school districts asking about how we can figure out a way to get school bus drivers test so we can get our kids to school. And, and then we still get the calls every day from parents calling because they need to find a test for their child and they like to not have to drive uh, a, a, a long distance to be able to do that. And they're sometimes frustrated by how many availabilities we have open. And, and I want you to know, we understand their frustration uh, and that DVS has been responding by staying open later, staying open on weekends. We freed up space, added a hundred spots to our testing capacity. Uh, and so we are doing everything we can to try and meet as many of the public's needs uh, that we're aware of. And we appreciate the opportunity to hear today uh, more about what those needs are. Uh, we are absolutely committed to getting 100% of our exam stations open as soon as possible. Uh, that transportation bill that was signed into law um, the end of June, early July was very clear. All exam stations that were closed due to COVID have to be reopened. Uh, and we have created and are now executing a plan that will in fact meet uh, that, that legislative desire uh, to make sure that all exam stations are open. Um, I can tell you that I expect many of these exam stations will be open even this fall, and every one of them will be open by January. Uh, we have some that are in far corners of the state that are, frankly, they were part-time stations. They were only open once or twice a week. Uh, and we, like every other employer uh, in the state and in the country, are struggling to get enough staff uh, to meet the needs that we have. 
I'm, I know as you drive around, I'm not sure uh, in your community if this is as acute as it is in the Twin Cities, but there isn't a, a restaurant, store, or a business that doesn't have a help wanted sign out in front of it right now. And unfortunately, DBS is also subject to those same economic forces of trying to get people that to, to work in this job uh, that frankly is... Uh, we don't have a signing bonus like the bus drivers do. We don't. We can't raise the salary like some of the other companies do. Um, we are. Uh, we're going to have to do what we can to try and entice people to come to work. Uh, and sometimes we're going to ask them to come into work in Greater Minnesota, where they're going to have to work in one station one day and then drive maybe hours to get to the other exam station so it can be open another day. Uh, part of the confidence I have in the fact that we are going to meet uh, and, and I hope exceed your expectations on getting those exam stations is based on the leadership that we have at DVS. And I'm excited to introduce you to, um, to one new and one not so new uh, DVS leadership team. Uh, the first I'll mention who will, will start off this presentation is Pong Shang. He is the new DVS director. Uh, he came to us from the Department of Revenue, is a background in uh, business operations. Uh, that's his academic and his background from, from Department of Revenue. And really, that is very acutely needed as uh, DVS is as much a business operation as it is a government service. Uh, and so he will be an increased, an incredibly strong leader for DVS. The other person that I, that I think you already know, but uh, and that has returned to us is Tony Anderson. Uh, Tony was part of our original team that helped us move out of Menlars and into, into the new driver's license systems, and he has come back as the new operations director. Uh, so once again, uh, we have a very strong team that will be leading this effort. Uh, we have a team that's got a very clear mission and a very clear direction and a very clear timeline. And so with that, I would turn it over to Director Shang to give you the, uh, the actual update on the DBS plan, unless there are questions that you have. Thank you, Commissioner Harrington. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll continue, uh, Commissioner, with uh, the presentation and, and uh, we'll have the uh, senators hold their questions till the end. Uh, uh, Mr. Shang, uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, uh, if you would uh, introduce yourself, uh, perhaps you could give us a, a, just a real brief bio of, of your uh, background because I don't think any of us know you yet. Uh, and then proceed with your testimony, please. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair uh, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Pong Zhang, and as Commissioner Harrington mentioned, newly joined to DVS. Uh, just a quick bio, I wasn't planning on this, uh, but a quick bio is um, I spent the last 10 years at the Department of Revenue um, in different areas of their operations, um, um, servicing taxpayers. Uh, before that, I was in the military. I um, spent uh, some time in Afghanistan and, and in the United States Marine Corps. And uh, after I got out of the Marines, I uh, attended the University of Minnesota Carlson School of, of Management, um, received my MBA, and uh, have been trying to uh, really have been enjoying my service to uh, Minnesotans and, and trying to make a difference for Minnesotans. So uh, I, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today and I'm really privileged and, and honored to be here to share some of the great work that's been happening at DVS on this specific effort. Um, and I will mention it several times throughout the presentation, but I just wanna also really give a lot of credit to our business partners, um, individuals and, and businesses, community, communities, uh, local government that have been really engaged in this work and um, pivotal in, in helping us move this forward. Uh, Megan, if you could go to the next slide, please. So uh, as Commissioner Harrington said, we are, we are actively engaged in, in opening uh, up exam stations. I will say in my short time here, this is clearly a priority and has been a priority of mine. Uh, we have several resource, resources really focused on trying to get exam stations open as quickly as possible. And as we talked to the plan, I, uh, I thought it was really important to share some of the context in which we are working in. And so um, for the benefit of, of myself learning this and also uh, for members of the committee, um, I want to share a little bit more about some of this context. So throughout Minnesota, we have hubs that are, that are placed throughout Minnesota that serve satellite locations, hub exam stations that serve satellite exam stations. Um, all of our hubs are open five days a week. 
And then satellite locations are open a set number of days per, per month. Um, and as Commissioner Harrington already mentioned, uh, the examiners will travel from the hub stations to satellite locations to, to service those locations provided uh, or to administer exams um, at those hours um, that, are, that those satellite locations are open. Um, a hub will serve between one and five satellite locations. And currently in Minnesota, we have 26 hubs and 67 satellite locations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to further illustrate this hub and satellite model, um, so we have the, the northwestern region of Minnesota here, and um, I'll just point out uh, Thief River Falls. So Thief, Thief River Falls is a hub station that services Roseau, Halleck, uh, Warren, East Grand Forks, and Crookston as their satellite locations. Um, so Thief River Falls will, will be open five days a week, and then again, we have examiners uh, that are traveling to those satellite locations. Um, in outside of the metro area, each of these hub stations have about three to four examiners um, that service all the, the entire region that they're in. Um, and I also, I think this really uh, points out really something really important that we, I wanted to emphasize here that um, even before the pandemic, uh, our customers in greater Minnesota had to travel significant distances to receive uh, services from these exam stations. And with the consolidation of our of exam stations through the pandemic, um, that's only exasperated exacerbated that um, that distance. And we absolutely recognize the challenge that puts on um, our customers in Greater Minnesota, and we are committed to opening these exam stations and, and returning these services to the community or to, to the community. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit of context and key times uh, that, uh, or key dates in our timeline here. Um, in March of 2020, the stay at home or order was issued um, and that closed all 93 exam stations, um, which included canceling 19,000 exams. Um, a few months later in May, uh, we, we, we reopened 15 exam stations, really with a focus on ensuring that we were able to provide social distancing and pandemic uh, safety protocols. Uh, not only for the safety of our staff, but also the safety of our customers and those and those folks receiving services from DVS. And we were, we had a pleasant observation of actually an increased efficiency and and number of of uh, exams that we could administer uh, through the consolidation. And um, I think part of that is the reduced travel and centralization of of exams. Um, but it was it. It was, a, 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 again, a pleasant observation that we had. Uh, next slide, please. But with that being said, there was an, there is, there was an outstanding demand for exams. And, and uh, on average in 2020, we, had, we conducted 3,700 road tests per week. Um, significantly, in, uh, between May and October of 2020, we, issued, we administered 81,000 class D road tests. Um, and in order to do that, uh, we expanded service hours um, and it, which included Saturdays throughout October of 2020 at many of our exam stations. And currently we offer services seven days a week at Arden Hills, Egan and Plymouth. Again, with, a, with uh, the desire to service as many Minnesotans as possible at our current exam stations. Next slide, please. So fast, flash, or sorry, fast forward to today. Uh, this last summer, the transportation bill was signed, uh, which included the um, plan to open all 93 exam stations uh, and also include appropriations for fiscal year 22 and 23 to open exam stations um, without and really with the intent of, of not reducing uh, services that we and efficiencies we gain through some of that consolidation. And so, uh, I'm sorry, Megan, next slide, please. So as we started the planning efforts for opening exam stations, uh, we really set, our, set out for ourselves some guiding principles, um, really a key principle of maintaining service level at exam stations. Again, those, some of those efficiencies that were gained there, we wanted to make sure that we were able to continue to uh, produce and provide service to as many as many Minnesotans as we, we currently can. 
um, it was really important for us to also maintain our scheduled appointments. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the appointment, the appointment process um, after I go through the, the guiding principles here. But maintaining those scheduled appointments um, was really a critical piece to, to our planning and the timing of our, our opening exam stations. Uh, returning to pre-pandemic service level at, a, at closed exam stations. And that means that for our hub stations, we want to get back to five days a week and for our satellite locations to return to those days, those designated days and hours um, throughout the month that those satellite locations were opened. Um, and of course, as a desire for all of us in here, um, reopening as, as stations as soon as possible, um, that uh, logistics permitting that we, we would do those as soon as we could. Um, and then really, really importantly, in the end, and I said, uh, I can't say this enough, but just uh, the engagement with local government, engagement with local business partners and, and, and different entities um, have, it has, is a priority for us and has been just pivotal in our plan. Um, and in our appointments, so something to some, uh, really to share about appointments is that we open appointments six months in advance um, to ensure that we have the staff available and designated to, to hold and maintain those appointments. And then um, as appointments become available, either through cancellations or through additional staffing that we're able to assign to, uh, to administer exams, we are opening those up weekly with the hope that Minnesotans can get into appointments sooner um, and that we're providing, again, as many exams as possible um, with uh, and and every single exam schedule or every single appointment is filled. Uh, next slide, please. So, in moving out of our planning phase and really moving into the logistics of, of reopening uh, exam stations, the three critical elements, the three critical pieces of opening re exam stations were um, working through the leases, um, ensuring that we had adequate staffing, um, as Commissioner Harrington had mentioned and really uh, working with our community partners to ensure that uh, their needs are being addressed and met as, as we are going through this exam opening state, uh, process. Next slide, please. So as we close exam stations in early 2020 and now uh, moving into reopening those exam stations, many of those leases expired or had to be renegotiated or were due for renegotiation, uh, 38 total. Um, and a, a barrier that we had un, we had not anticipated, um, but are working through now, and, work, and and that collaboration again with local government has been really critical um, and effective, is that uh, some of these leases had to be negotiated through uh, city council and county boards, um, and that really depending on some of the timing that they that they meant for for decision making. Next slide, please. Again, working with our community has, was is critical, and some of the um, we're really proud of some of the efforts and, and relationships we were able to not only build but maintain throughout this and leverage um, over over this uh, reopening plan. We have communicated with over 400 business partners, including our driver's license agents, uh, city and county administrators, and tribal governments. Um, we've leveraged our networks, uh, our community, our business partners, such as the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities, League of Minnesota Cities. Minnesota Intercounty Association and Association of Minnesota Counties. Um, and I just wanna give a special thanks to all of our business partners who helped us um, identify leasing opportunities where, where our leases couldn't be renew, re, renewed or renegotiated. Um, that has been a, a challenge and that um, engaging our business partners have, has been really critical in allowing us to identify different opportunities We've also had one-on-one -on -one discussions with individual communities and legislators, again, to really understand what individual communities and legis uh, um, legislative er districts, um, what their unique needs are and ensuring that we're partnering and moving those services back into those communities. Next slide, please. So that leads us to uh, kind of our final, our, my final slide here, which is our reopening target. Um, again, we're really dedicated to opening as many exam stations as early as possible. Um, our current plan has it so that we, uh, are, we have 26 exam stations open, and open right now. Uh, we have 
we'll have 32 exam stations open by the end of November. Um, before the end of December, we hope to we are plan to have 41 exam stations open. And then before uh, the end of January 2022, all 93 exam stations reopen for services um, back to pre-pandemic service levels for, um, for all of Minnesota. And I would re be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to uh, ask for your support and help in, um, in identifying and encouraging uh, Minnesotans to apply for DVS positions. Um, it is, it is uh, they are challenging positions, um, but this is really a noble service. And I, I think that they will, uh, Minnesotans will find a lot of gratitude in working for the state and doing good work for Minnesotans. Um, and we, so we welcome you to invite others to, to apply for jobs that we have posted and that will really aid in, in getting, us the, uh, getting us to be able to open exam stations um, sooner. Thank but you, I'll Mr. Zhang. Um, uh, if you would uh, hang around and, uh, to the end for some questions, uh, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, at this time, I'm gonna go to Mr. Anderson. Um, Director of Operations for DVS. Mr. Anderson, are you there? There Thank you, you are. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Derwin. Some, um, sometimes it's hard to spot someone <laughs> amongst all the faces. Uh, please identify yourself for the record and, and proceed, please. Uh, thank you, Chair Newman. Uh, Tony Anderson, uh, Operations Director here for uh, Driver and Vehicle Services, and I am present to assist Director Zhang with any questions that the committee may have. So, no presentation for myself. I'm here for here to support any questions. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, we're we're going to go now. We've got uh, four uh, folks who are, are coming in to testify from the private sector. Uh, uh, the Trucking Association, a private uh, trucking business. Uh, we've got uh, a, a county commissioner with us and then uh, someone representing the school bus operators. Uh, and we've invited these folks in to, to, to just provide you with some information, you being DV, DPS, some information as to what is going on in their world. And uh, We'd appreciate it very much uh, if you would listen carefully to what they have to say because this uh, testing issue is really important to not only the people of the state of Minnesota who are getting their class D licenses, but also to industry and in our, in our economy in general. So I'm gonna start with Mr. Hausladen uh, from the uh, Trucking Association. Uh, welcome to the committee. If you identify yourself and proceed with your testimony, please. Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. John Hausladen, President of the Minnesota Trucking Association. We are a statewide organization representing 610 motor carriers and their allied vendors. And I am joined today by Mr. Trent Morrell, who is a member of our board of directors. So we'll be tag teaming. I, before I jump in, I do want to say uh, just a little off topic, uh, how well phase two of MinDrive seems to be going from our perspective. Uh, I do want to say that the agency engaged us and brought us in early on uh, to help problem solve. And that's the model we like. Uh, we think it worked in this environment. And we honestly think as we go through dealing with CDL testing and access, we can use the same principles and, and move forward with some of the problems that we are facing. Uh, one of a truck driver's most important tools is his or her commercial driver's license. Uh, this credential makes it possible to earn a living and to deliver the critical goods that we all need. The gateway to this credential is the Department of Public Safety exam stations. Now, whether you're a new driver taking your knowledge test or your road test or a seasoned professional driver, renewing your CDL and endorsements, you must go to an exam station. It is a well-documented fact that the trucking industry is facing a serious shortage of professional truck drivers. And in turn, this shortage is impacting a very challenged supply chain. We need a system that efficiently, and I think that's the stress word today, that efficiently puts new drivers behind the wheel and quickly processes renewals. Unfortunately, today's system is not as efficient as it could be. Those seeking CDLs, renewals, or endorsements must compete with teenagers obtaining their driver's license for testing times and computer monitor space. 
And we have had reports from members running into delays processing new or renewed CDLs. Fleets have sent prospective drivers to exam stations who have invested literally the better part of a whole day attempting to access a test, only to be told they need to come back the next day. And similarly, we have had drivers seeking to obtain renewals of hazardous material endorsements who have faced significant delays. Every minute a driver is sitting in an exam station is time that driver is off the road delivering essential food, medicine, building supplies, and frankly, the basic of life that every citizen and every business needs. So our recommendation is that DVS find new ways to prioritize CDL credentialing over Class D licenses, both in terms of predictable road testing times and taking the knowledge test. Uh, we continue the Senate to push for a third party testing, which I know you did in the special session. And we also asked the state to consider allowing an online option for the knowledge test, but it is not possible right now. Now, as I said at the beginning, I wanna acknowledge that DVS has reached out to the MTA and has invited us to participate in working groups to find solutions to these problems, and we have. We appreciate their efforts to partner with industry, and we pledge our continued support to do that. So with your approval, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to introduce Mr. Trent Morell of Morell Transfer and Morell and Morell. Thank you, Mr. Hausleiden. Uh, Mr. Morell, are you there somewhere? I don't see you yet. He's there, Mr. Chairman, but his uh, microphone is muted. Is, is he muted? How about now? Do you hear me? Now, now we can hear you. Uh, we do not have video, but we do have you uh, on audio. Uh, uh, Mr. Morell, uh, welcome to the committee. There you are. There, there you go. Are. Welcome to the committee. Uh, if you would identify yourself, uh, give us an idea who you are associated with, and then proceed with your testimony, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. I am Trent Morell, president of Morell Transfer and Morell and Morell. We are a third generation family owned and operated trucking company located in Elk River, Minnesota. We are a diverse business operating vans, flatbeds, end dumps, dry bulk, and over dimensional trailers. We deliver raw materials and manufactured products to job sites, roads, and businesses, including hazard, hazmat and hazardous materials. We have approximately 60 trucks and employ 85 people. As Mr. Hauslotten stated, it is critical that we keep our trucks rolling. A driver out of the truck can delay a major project and seriously impact our operational efficiency. I am speaking to you today to share our recent experiences with the Anoka exam station. My experience is personal. I maintain my CDL with hazmat and enjoy spending time in the truck most days. In July, I took a day out of the truck and I went into the exam station to renew my CDL and take the hazardous material written exam. This is required at, at every license renewal. I was told they were full and when in fact they were using only two of the 10 exam stations. I asked if I could make an appointment and was told no. I would have to try again another day. I asked if there were slower times when it would be easier for me to get in and was told maybe in the mornings. I did return several days later and completed my renewal due to the, in part, the fact that they had started using more exam stations. Trying to learn from that experience, along with some other interactions, our office team attempted to call ahead on behalf of a different driver who was needed to get a test for his hazmat renewal. Our team was on hold for over an hour. When they did speak with a representative, they were told only the only solution was to go to a different testing site. My team then sought the phone number for different exam stations in hopes of preventing a drive of an hour or longer and only to be told the same thing. The exam station staffer said they were too busy to take calls. When asked to speak to a supervisor, we were told none were available and then were hung up on. To put a fine point on this, our team documented some of their experiences. On June 25th, our person arrived at 2.15, told they were at their quota for the day and would have to come back. 
On June 30th, arrived at 8 a.m. and got in to test at 11 a.m. On July 1st, arrived at 7.50, got in at 11.45. On July 6th, arrived at 9 a.m. and was turned away. On July 8th, 7.45 a.m. and was told it would be hours. Employee left due to the wait. On July 7th, arrived at 7 a.m. and was third in line, but didn't get in until 10 a.m. or so. Mr. Chairman, we we're just truckers trying to do our jobs. These wait times and poor customer service create more reasons for good men and women to leave our industry. We are facing workforce shortages that is impacting the slot su supply chain. Licensing delays make it very difficult to recruit and retrain, retain talent. From an operational standpoint perspective, it is next to impossible to plan loads when you don't know how long a driver will be hung up for an exam. We appreciate the additional resources the legislature appropriated for the exam stations and hope it will make a real difference in addressing our needs. To put it simple, DVS needs to make CDL exams and road tests a priority to keep the supply chain moving. Thank you for your time and I am available for questions if needed. Thank you, Mr. Morrell. I appreciate that very much. Uh, next we have uh, on deck, Mr. Uh, Herman, who is a Freeborn County Commissioner. And I do see you, uh, Mr. Herman. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Ted Herman. I'm a Freeborn County uh, Commissioner, as you said. Um, I spoke earlier uh, several months ago regarding the uh, uh, driver's exam uh, license closure. Uh, first, I want to just get back to what uh, the director Harrington said that he's been in touch with everybody. Our last contact with the, D with the uh, his department was a form letter on August 24th that talked about uh, the struggles of hiring and that it would be an ambitious goal to be open by January 1st. I'd also like to touch on that we are one of the counties that had to have a lease done. Uh, our lease was signed by us as commissioners on September uh, 21st, uh, was accepted and renewed on September 27th by their department. Uh, Freeborn County has stuck uh, quite a bit of money into the DVS site for, for them. We put in $30,000, we moved the site so it'd be more convenient for our uh, residents or citizens. And yet we haven't been told until today at this meeting that potentially by January that they would be open. Um, again, we've vested money. We, we've done our, every step that we can to continue giving a good service to our community. Um, my neighbor regularly chews my ears because he has to go to uh, Northern Minnesota for his daughter to get a driver's exam. We're from Albert Lee, Minnesota. He's got to drive an hour and a half to get his daughter a driver's license. Reiterate a little bit uh, what Mr. Morrell said. Um, our farmers have to leave the field to get a driver's license. They're driving to Rochester or Mankato. That's 60 miles one way. Our farmers have to pay for the fuel. They're going to sit there and wait. The farm's not out. The truck's not in the field getting filled up with corn or soybeans at this time of the year. It, it's been a real hard, hard, heartache for our citizens. Um, and I, I just want to stress that the lack of communication has been a real kicker. Um, a form letter to me does not... Um, necessary keep you informed it, it's just this form letter they send out to everybody and uh it doesn't meet our satisfaction um so yeah, that's all i have I, I apologize for not having a lot of information but i was just asked to, to speak yesterday evening um you can tell in my voice i'm a little frustrated as a commissioner about this process of what's been going on but i appreciate the opportunity to be able to express our concerns Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Herman. Thank you for Thank you. Uh, being present uh, this afternoon. The last uh, testifier that we have is Mr. McMahon, who is with the school bus operators. Uh, welcome to the committee, uh, Mr. McMahon. Please identify yourself and proceed. Uh, Chair Newman, member of the committee, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Scott McMahon with the firm Flaherty and Hood, here on behalf of our client, the Minnesota School Bus Operators Association. Mm -hmm. The MSBOA represents the private contractors who contract with school districts uh, and run routes on about 60% of the school bus routes across the state. Um, they send their condolences that they sent me to testify rather than one of them. Uh, but with a driver shortage and with school letting out right now, uh, it was more convenient for me to be here than for one of them to be here. 
as all of you are aware, uh, school districts and school bus operators are facing uh, probably one of the worst driver shortages that we've ever had. We always start the school year short some drivers, uh, but as the, the weeks go on, we, we see more happening. Right now with the economic realities that we're in, uh, we're just not seeing candidates come uh, come to our doors looking to drive bus. And so it's it's a real challenge just for us to get the, the workers that we're looking for. Um, but we have had issues with the with the testing sites being closed to try and get those candidates then uh, licensed and ready to be uh, driving our, our school kids around. We just did a survey a couple of weeks ago of all of our operators. And one of the biggest challenges that they, that they did cite is that when a candidate comes in to become a school bus driver, and they're told that they're going to have to drive an hour, hour and a half away to go take a test, they turn around and walk out the door. Um, we are optimistic that as more sites get opened, that that pressure point will uh, will start to go away. Um, I do want to acknowledge, uh, as Senator, as you uh, indicated at the start of the hearing, there are a few new faces that we have at DBS uh, that haven't been before this committee in the past. Uh, we've been working closely with the agency over the past uh, number of weeks as they've transitioned. And we're uh, we're optimistic that that we're seeing some some real changes in the leadership at DBS uh, in a very proactive, uh, productive way moving forward. And so there have been some things that they have done uh, that we're excited about. Uh, for instance, I just received an email today that they are planning uh, here soon to have uh, some some testing opportunities on Saturdays, uh, primarily focused for CDL and for school bus drivers which is a great opportunity for us to try and get some of these folks that are looking to get their license uh, licenses done. Um, so we look forward to continuing working with, uh, with the agency, uh, but this has, been, uh, this has been a challenge for us uh, over, the, over the pandemic as we deal with, with our bus driver shortage. Thank you, Mr. McMahon. Uh, and for Commissioner Harrington and uh, Mr. Zhang in, in particular, uh, what I'm hearing is is sort of three three problems: uh, lack of communication, um, uh, poor customer service, and the absolute need to get these stations up and running and operational, so that the people in the state of Minnesota, both the private in both in the private sector with the Class D licenses, but also the school bus drivers and the CDL licenses. It's just imperative that that uh, we provide uh, a better service to them than what we are doing. So uh, I, I recognize, uh, Mr. Zhang, that you are uh, uh, new at, uh, with the department, and we ha we certainly have to give you the opportunity to be able to perform. But um, I really wanted you to hear from the private sector directly as to some of the problems that they are experiencing and how severe uh, these problems are uh, in hopes that you know, we can do, we can work together and, and do a better job for the people of, of the state of Minnesota. Now I'm gonna open it up to questions by senators and senators, I will tell you, I will, I will do my best to recognize the raised hand feature on Zoom if I miss, uh, turn on your video and wave your hand in front of the cameras and, uh, and uh, I will uh, do my very best to spot you. Uh, the first hand that I see up is Senator Yuzinski. I think mine was the last hand up, but I'll go ahead, sorry. Uh, mine's a pretty quick question. So uh, Mr. Zong, so if I'm up in Halleck or Roseau, I mean, what is the, you know, Best, uh, what, what time do you believe is, is adequate to be able to travel to get my license renewed or, or do that? I mean, I know there's, you know, there's a, it says in Halleck, I see on your map, Halleck has opened, but if, if they're not open that day, what is the ideal distance you see uh, for citizens having to travel uh, to get their license? It just seems like if you look at that Northwest corner of the state, it's awfully long to be able to go in and get a test. Um, I just don't believe it's fair for those citizens to have to travel that far, uh, because again, I see you know there's a spoke in the hub, and the, and the distant uh, location has very limited hours. But what's the ideal travel time to get something done uh, for a citizen across the state, and that's for rural or for uh, metro? Mr. Shung. 
Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski, uh, thank you for that question. You, you know, I think that that analysis definitely needs to take place, and um, I'm really appreciative of um, the support from Chair King and the independent independent expert review. I think some of the some of the information from that report will be able to provide some insight into what is reasonable for um, Minnesotans and and the travel time necessary to get services from DVS. Um, certainly, I think taking a data-driven approach is, is, is um, a good approach. And um, I think that is, is worth looking into. So un I, unfortunately, I don't have a, a, an answer for you, but I do think that, again, that independent expert review will, will provide some real insight. And we look forward to receiving that and taking that data and making good use of it. Thank you. Just one uh, follow-up, Senator, Senator Jasinski. Uh, one follow-up. Just I, I so I know you were not here at the time, but I I had uh, constituents meetings here, and, and the mayor of uh, Otana got on and was frustrated that the residents of Otana could not have a testing station in Otana. There's one in Faribault. Uh, just so you know, the the residents of these towns in a in a town of the size of twenty five thousand people, which Otana is, believe they should have a testing site in their community and not have to travel. Uh, 45 minutes to an hour away to get that you know test done. So there is a lot of frustration there. Uh, I'm just echoing what my mayors and, and what my district are saying is, you know, why can't the city of Otana, a city of, of almost 30,000 people, not have a testing location in their city? So thank you. Mr. Zhang, any response? Uh, no, I, I really appreciate the insight and the feedback. I think that, um, Again, I think that independent expert review is going to provide a, a really insightful information and um, certainly population should be a, a, a relevant factor in this decision. Okay, we'll go next to Senator Howe. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I don't know who wants to take this, but uh, uh, when did the planning for reopening these sites begin? I mean, uh, can someone tell me exactly when we, we started the planning process? Commissioner or Mr. Zhang, who wants to take that? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'm, Mr. Going to I'm going to defer that over to Tony Anderson, who has a little bit more history here with, with DVS. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Tony Anderson with uh, Driver and Vehicle Services. Um, I recently joined the rejoined the organization on uh, October, or excuse me, uh, August 15th. That following week, uh, we got a project manager assigned to um, getting the getting the initiative for uh, offices reopening. So, um, on uh, like I said, that that following week from uh, when I joined, we got uh, specifically a project manager assigned. Started uh, internal stakeholder meetings as well as reaching out to uh, some of our partners with uh, Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities as well as League of Minnesota Cities. Prior to that, I'm un unable to share um, when if dialogue was occurring, but we can definitely follow up if requested. Senator Hall. Well, thank you for that answer, but I, I, you know, I find it hard to believe that, and I think it was, uh, Commissioner, I, I think that's very poor uh, process to, once you close these, these I, I can't believe that we ever decide that that was ever a decision that these were going to be permanently closed stations, that we wouldn't have opened these up and we wouldn't have immediately started that planning process uh, to have actually a plan to go forward when a, when the money became available uh, to open these up as soon as we did close them, we should have been planning you know, for a process to open them up. Uh, the next question I have is, and I don't know if you didn't have that answer, I don't know if you have this answer. When we closed those stations and went down to the 26, did we actually lay people off and actually fire people? Did we reduce staff? During that period of time, Commissioner Harrington, Senator Howell, uh, Mr. Chair, I do not recall laying anybody off. On the other hand, we did have uh, we did reallocate staff uh, as we needed to try and get enough staff to fill the operations offices where we had uh, significant populations and significant business. Uh, that was, I believe. Uh, the idea behind when we started closing stations, and this, I guess, responds to your earlier question, Senator Howe, was that we were not sure how long we would be closed. 
Uh, and we also recognize that in many stations, uh, they were such a part-time operation that uh, we had to consider whether or not the business needs uh, and the funding for keeping a station that was only open one day a week, but we were paying for lease space and others uh, for more time than that was uh, a good use of the, the taxpayers' dollars. And so uh, we absolutely <laughs> did look at uh, whether or not we were going to reopen some of those stations. Uh, and that was one of the considerations that we was discussed during the last legislative session um, as, we pre as we presented our side of that. And then um, once the instructions were given to us uh, and the funding was given to us to make sure that all those stations reopened, uh, we were in the process of hiring new staff to run DVS. Once that staff was, was brought on board, we then initiated uh, the next piece of that, which was to start getting the, the exam stations reopened and, and creating the plan for that. Senator Hull. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner. Did When you looked at reopening, did you look at a different system other than the hub and spoke? Uh, I've had experience with hub and spoke in the military. I, I can tell you that uh, it sometimes works and sometimes doesn't work very well. So the question I have is, as we looked at opening stations up, did we look at doing something different than a hub and spoke system? Mr. Harrington uh, or Mr. Zong? I'll, I'll, I probably can take that one or see Assistant Commissioner Alino, who was um, more directly involved. We did look at a variety of different models uh, that we could look at, including looking at automating uh, some of the work we're doing in terms of kiosks and other operations there, automating some of the computers, computerization of the, the stations. Uh, I can't give you a, a direct answer as to what other options we looked at. I believe Hub and Spoke was the uh, primary model that we we landed on and decided that that was going to be uh, the direction that we would follow. Uh, but I see uh, Assistant Commissioner Lino's hand is up. He may have a better answer because he was more involved in the actual day-to-day -day planning of that. Mr. Lino. Chair Newman and members, thank you. And thank you for the observation on efficiency. We actually worked that discussion fairly thoroughly. And one of the things we really tried to focus on was looking at how long, how far Minnesotans had to drive to get an exam. Uh, we also knew right away that we would need to start focusing on reopening <laughs> locations, but we were also trying to balance that out from an efficiency perspective. Driver exam is far more efficient if we stayed to some centralized testing locations. And in fact, after the state shutdown, I think we were behind almost 81,000 road tests that had to be caught up that summer. And I think DVS did an exceptional job of catching up on those that were displaced during that time, in addition to covering what's traditionally a very busy time of year during summer for those exams. But even at that, we were trying to balance out all the various things and, and how to deliver the services to the best ability possible. Follow-up question, Senator Hull. Well, thank you for that. Uh, due to the fact you were at 81,000 as a backlog, <clears throat> can you tell me what the current backlog is for Class D and for CDL licenses currently? Senator, I can ask DVS to, and then, excuse me, Chair, Mo, Chair Newman and uh, Senator Hull. Mr. Lino, go ahead. Um, I can certainly have DVS uh, get that information for you and, and they'll get it back to you as quickly as possible. Appreciate that. Anything further, Senator Hall? I, I guess, you know, I, I, I will I will just say that I, I'm 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 just troubled with the aspect that we're we're having licensed examiners drive and we're paying these folks to drive to these locations. And I'm not sure if we haven't looked at uh, having these locations have hiring part-time people to be at these locations. And I find it hard to believe that you had 26 stations open, you had to renegotiate 58 leases, which left you 32 of those locations that still had leases open. And you're gonna open those up by the way it sounds as if I look at the slide, I'm not quite sure if that was November or whatever. I, I find it troubling we couldn't open those things much sooner than that uh, because the leases were still current. 
I would have thought that those that could have been a reallocation of staff and you could have opened up those 32 much sooner than they're currently not even open now. Uh, I, I find that uh, troubling to say the least and I'll end my questions at that, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Howell. Um, Senator Kiffmeyer. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I always have to find the, uh, get my cursor over to uh, get to the unmute button. So thank you very much. Uh, so I appreciate the fact that uh, we have our testifiers here today. And I have a question first for uh, Mr. Morell. Mr. Morell, I think you're still here. If you could um, address a question for me. I, I don't see you on camera yet, so I just want to be sure. He just unmuted, uh, uh, Senator. So go ahead and ask your question. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Morrell, first of all, welcome to the committee. Glad to have you here. And from Elk River, which is in my district, um, we all well know Morrell and the work that you do and the good business that you do as well in our area. My question for you, though, is when you have uh, drivers going in for CDLs, they're on the road, they're on the road for a long time, they're going back and forth, scheduling other things. What kind of productivity loss do you have, waste of time, and cost of money through that kind of situation? Could you quantify that for us? Mr. Merle. Yes, I'm sure I could quantify it. I don't know if I can do it right now this afternoon. What we attempt to do is to allot time as they're coming in, in an afternoon when they would be off duty and can do it in the course of their normal activities. What the hurdles that we faced this summer especially this summer, that's what I pointed to, uh, was the fact that we had uncertainty whether we could get in or not. And so therefore, we would show up and be turned away, have to go back another time. We would, you know, get there and have to wait, uncertain on how long we'd have to wait. Uh, sometimes we'd send them by in the truck as they're working and just wait for them to become available again so forth and so on. So as far as quantifying, and I'm, I'm not sure, uh, it would be 100% loss as they're down and not operating or hauling something. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Morrell. Um, I wasn't necessarily looking for a specific uh, dollar amount, especially not at this time, but we can all understand, I think, whether it's the school bus drivers, as Mr. McMahon testified, as Mr. Hauslop testified, um, as Mr. Herman, county commissioner testified, farmers, truck drivers, school bus drivers, every one of them, when they are not on the road doing their work of farming, delivering goods, transporting our children to schools, that means they're not productive, that is money wasted and money cost. And that is a very important consideration. I consider this actually, you see it on the news today, this whole supply chain issue is putting people at risk. It isn't just their specific, whether it's morels or school bus or farmers, uh, it's the Minnesotans that they serve that are not getting their goods, not getting their services, not getting their supplies, whether it's manufacturing, all kinds of things are hindered. And you go back to this, CDL, you go back to this kind of situation, people have to take off work in order to take their kids to get their driver's test. Huge loss of productivity, huge loss of money that is going wasted. And the linchpin of all that all goes back to DVS, DVS, DVS. And by the way, all those fees that are paid for this testing, all of those fees go into a special account and are there specifically to for that service. So this isn't like they are just doing this, like that other taxpayers at their, at their goodness of their heart are chipping into this. People are actually paying for this service. So there's absolutely no excuse to provide that. One of the things that I wanna ask uh, in particular of either, I think that Mr. Zhang, I appreciate your military service. I appreciate your uh, skill in coming on. You need time for that. But Mr. Anderson, you, I would like to have a question for you. So in regards to this, when I think of all of these things and what can we do to help, uh, my uh, Wright County, which is also in my district, 
has mentioned using deputy registrars. They already have an office. They're already connected to DVS. They are already um, in uh, most of these towns. And in particular, um, Wright County is asking, what about using deputy registrars to augment DVS? And uh, that way there's already a connection. They're already in the system. Could you respond, Mr. Anderson, in regards to the consideration of, of enhancing and using deputy registrars? Mr. Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. Um, we have an opportunity to work with our deputy registrars on um, the third-party proctor process. So within um, with DVS, we have an ability to um, enter into a memorandum of understanding with, uh, for example, deputy registrars to administer third-party proctor exams for uh, for individuals or for specifically where you're talking about with Wright County, and would uh, welcome to provide additional information for you if that. Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, well, my chair was. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My question was specifically, though. Have you considered them to do actual become testing stations, not just proctors for exams, but actually expanding them uh, to be sites of um, on the road type testing? I mean, their their hubs, their work, they have connections to DVS already. Have you considered using deputy registrars who would be willing to um, also do on the road testing? That was more my question, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Kiffmeyer, to allow for that, we would need uh, legislative change for uh, deputy registrars to commit uh, to be able to complete the over the road exams. Mr. Chair. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Now I know um, a little bit where the, um, the hinge is there in regards to helping to consider that and facilitate it. But one of the things that I'm hearing here though, uh, actually, is a lack of urgency. I don't know if you realize, folks, out there, farmers, school bus drivers, and other people, um, truck drivers from the East Coast to the West Coast, this is a crisis. And I'm just not hearing enough of a sense of urgency. And um, people out there in Minnesota are not feeling very good or feeling respected in regards to the costs and the work that they are doing uh, that is so dependent upon this situation, that lack of urgency um, is really, uh, we are, we are in a plan. And so I see these plans that go out to January of 22. Um, I just think there needs to be a greater sense of urgency. Uh, the other thing is additional resources. I've talked about deputy registrars. One of the things um, that I think also, we had a bill um, last year, I think uh, Senator Housley carried this bill and at the time we were trying to say, this is urgent, this is a need, this is a crisis. My gosh, if it was back then, it's even more so now. So what about considering again, let's get involved with our third party on the road testers. Uh, we have testers out there right now that are doing training. I'm rather, I would say not testers, they're doing training, but again, a ready source of people who already have knowledge about on the road who have already in previous committee hearings expressed an interest for this, I think it is time to open up and consider using this. Um, if DVS and all of you, whatever, and this is too much, not able to get this rolling, then let's get into the private sector and start having some of these, third, these uh, testers that are out there that are trainers that are out there also be able to do uh, some on the road testing. Of course, we want them to be supervised and to be worked with. They're out there already. This is a ready group of people who could be really, really helpful. But DVS has opposed that and has not been willing to. This is now in a, you see it on the news all the time, a crisis. We just can't sit here and take this kind of a, a motion uh, that is in a little bit too slow um, and wait and wait and wait. The other thing I wanna comment on, but I would like to, um, I'm gonna make this comment and then let you answer this question that I've mentioned about third party trainers also become on the road testers. So my comment in regards to this is that I am not confident that we are seeing the, the speed and the resolution of what we need to have happen here. And if we think this is bad now, um, I can see this becoming a lot worse. And so deputy registrars, 
change the law. Okay, we'll work on it. But uh, the other things, but the, the lack of willingness to accept that. So could I get a response uh, from either you, Commissioner Harrington, that might be an appropriate similar? Are you ready, Commissioner Harrington, to realize this is a crisis now? And going to um, our uh, trainers that are out there, driving trainers, enabling them to also be on the road testers under the supervision could be a great asset to you. Also um, looking at deputy registrars. Commissioner Harrington, would you be willing to look at that and consider that? And is there anything that keeps you currently right now from using uh, what we are already having is uh, trainers for driving trainers to also use them as testers? Is there something that would hinder from you? Is that a legislative action? Uh, but are you willing to consider that and use those two avenues to augment uh, DVS? Commissioner Harrington. Mr. Chair, Senator Kipmeyer. Uh, we have considered that, and my understanding is the subject matter experts uh, did not recommend that to me. Uh, and so having uh, listened to the subject matter experts and others uh, in regards to third party testing, we did not support that uh, when it came up in legislation last year. Uh, and I have not gotten any new information that makes me uh, believe that it is uh, prudent to do that now. Uh, one of the pieces of the data that was very persuasive to me is that the testing regimen as it's currently configured uh, has made Minnesota one of the safest states in terms of driving, uh, far safer than the states where third-party testing is currently in existence. And, and we were not willing to sacrifice uh, the safety uh, that the tests provide in terms of making sure that folks that do get their license are in fact safe drivers. Uh, for uh, an expedience. Uh, I, if there is additional information from Senator Kipmeyer or others uh, that would give me uh, greater certainty of on the safety end of things, I would be happy to consider it. But that was, I believe, the primary reason why we did not support third party testing when it came up in the last legislative session. Senator Kipmeyer. Well, Commissioner Harrington, then we're kind of left in this scenario of make do, especially in rural Minnesota. That means those of us in rural Minnesota that don't live in some of those areas are left with a long drive. Now the testers are reimbursed for their mileage. However, our Minnesotans aren't, our truck drivers aren't, our school bus folks aren't. And so Ms. Commissioner Harrington, again, we're in a crisis right now. This is a crisis. Our farmers, school bus, our truck drivers and the delivery. And so Commissioner Harrington, if that's the position you're gonna take, then I think you're gonna to have to really create a greater sense of urgency and speed and up your plan in regards to having results through DVS. If that's the position you're gonna take, then you need to deliver that and not just tell rural Minnesota, just drive into the Metro, just drive into some other big city uh, because in the rural Minnesota area, it's okay if you drive a lot and it's okay if you have to take time off work. It's okay if you don't have the same service that the metro areas of those regional centers have. That is not a very good message for rural Minnesota. And they are the ones that need to have the same service. They pay the fees, they pay for these things, and they should have the same service as anybody else in the metro area that lives much closer. So I'd like to see a greater sense of urgency and delivery for this um, need that we have that is a crisis now here in Minnesota and across the country, but here in Minnesota is my job to look after. And I really hope Commissioner Harrington, there's gonna be a much greater sense of urgency from you and your staff for a paid service uh, that Minnesotans should much be treated much more respectfully. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, Mr. McMahon, uh, remind us, did we not do uh, something with school bus drivers licenses a couple of years ago uh, to, to aid in getting them their licenses? Yeah, Chair Newman. Um, so in Minnesota for school bus drivers, uh, we do allow a third party testing for the driving test. Um, what we did a couple years ago, prior to uh, to your omnibus bill a couple years ago, 
The third party tester uh, would be a school bus operator um, and they could test the driving candidates of other school bus operators. Uh, so if, if I had a school bus company, I could test your drivers or you could test my drivers if you have a third party tester. Uh, the change that we made a couple of years ago uh, allowed the companies to test their own drivers. So if I had the company and I had a candidate come in, they could uh, they could provide the the driving test for their uh, for their drivers. They still need to uh, conduct, I believe, at least twelve tests a year to maintain their certification. But that's only for the driving test. They're not allowed to do anything with the knowledge tests in that process. And if I recall correctly, uh, Mr. McMahon, the reason why uh, the, uh, the the driver's test was allowed is because of a severe backlog, uh, and it was an attempt to get school bus drivers properly licensed and on the road. Is that correct? Yes, it was. Uh, it was you know part of our attempt to address the the backlog that we were seeing at the time, and and we have seen for some time in. Uh, getting drivers in for that driving test. Um, you know, we were seeing situations where it would be four or five, six weeks after a candidate has done their written test before we could get them in for, for the driving test. So it was that attempt to give the, an alternate opportunity for, uh, for that part of the test to get done. Thank you, Mr. McMahon. Uh, Commissioner, uh, I I agree fully with Senator Kiffmeyer that this is an urgent matter that has to be addressed. Um, and I, I am not in agreement with uh, the, the flat statement that third party testing cannot be conducted safely by the private sector. If we can do it in terms of at least the driving test for the school bus drivers who are ferrying our children around, I would think it would be equally uh, safe to do it with a commercial CDL as requested by the Trucking Association. Uh, I, would, I would ask commissioner that your agency look seriously into the uh, arena of third party testing in general school bus drivers, CDLs, class D. Uh, I'm not convinced at all that the only safe way to do it is through a state agency, perhaps supervised or licensed by a state agency, but perhaps if we could get the private sector involved and have them help us with getting these licenses issued, it may be a way out of this conundrum. And I'm not seeing this problem being solved in the very near future. I have no doubt, Commissioner, that you're working hard at it. I believe that, I really do. But it's a pretty significant problem for you to solve. And perhaps this public sector would be uh, a way to help us, help the people in the state of Minnesota. Senator Kiffmeyer, do you have your hand back up? Mr. Chairman? Commissioner Harrington. Yeah, uh, just, just to be clear, uh, the third party testing issue that, that we were not in support of is the class D. Uh, it's the, the 16 year olds and the others that are doing uh, class D testings, not the CDLs. We have not uh, opposed uh, CDL testing. And as, as was mentioned by the school bus uh, operators, uh, that is allowed and we don't have a uh, particular opposition there. Uh, I, the feds do control CDL uh, written and driving examinations. And so we would have to work with them on any modifications to uh, that, but we're certainly open to that. And, and just to, to give you some sense of, of how we believe it, how urgent we believe this, um, exam stations have been open seven days a week uh, since June. Uh, they continue to be open and we've had additional school bus Saturdays that we have brought in where we've been able to bring hundreds of people in or schedule hundreds of exams on Saturdays because we do believe this is urgent and, and literally we are, we have gone from a five day a week model of operation to a seven day a week model of operation uh, to try and make sure that uh, every opportunity uh, that we are maximizing our staff and maximizing our facilities uh, to the greatest extent that we can. 
Uh, I can promise you that we do see this as urgent. Uh, that is why we why we have uh, you know we are continuing to look at how can we make modifications to this. Uh, and we see specifically the school bus drivers and the truck drivers, the the farm drivers, as being the areas where we believe that is the most urgent. Um, uh, in no small part because that is where we have heard directly from Minnesota companies uh, that have expressed the need to be able to get people in the door so that they can get uh, uh, props out of the field and to harvest or students from home and school and back again. Uh, so we are working and we do believe we, ha we do see that sense of urgency. I am open to further conversations on the CDL with the feds and with the legislature. Um, it was class D that we were particularly concerned about uh, changing that to a third party uh, model is where we were most concerned about the safety issue. Commissioner, the, the uh, driving exam stations that are open seven days a week, is that in the Metro only or is that statewide? I believe that's statewide, but I will check and have an answer for you shortly. All right, uh, and you are, uh, I, I take it, uh, open to do uh, to work with the legislature and the trucking association uh, to try and get the uh, uh, CDL third party testing up and operational in Minnesota. Is that correct? If we can do it safely, I'm open to the conversation. Is there any reason why you th you think it cannot be done safely? I don't have any data that says it can't be done safely. The fact that the school bus as, as, uh, has uh, been able to do that safely, I think is a, is a pretty good marker that uh, it can be, uh, but I don't wanna make that an absolute statement because I don't have enough facts in front of me to be able to, to say, absolutely, we are, are, are ready to move forward with that. Mr. McMahon, uh, as a result of allowing third-party testing for driving for school bus operators, any increase in the safety factor in the state of Minnesota? You know, Senator, um, to, your, to your question, um, the last thing that any of our operators want is a bad bus driver on the road. Um, and so if, if we see them through the testing process or in the start of their driving career that we have concerns with them, um, they're not gonna be a school bus driver anymore. And so, you know, that's the commitment that, that we have had with the third party testing process and that's what we're seeing play out. And so we're not seeing we don't see any difference between the quality of the driver who goes through the third party uh, testing process versus those who do their driving tests through the state agency. Mr. House Layden, are you still here? There you are, Mr. House Layden. The commissioner has mentioned uh, that, you know, the, the federal government is involved in uh, uh, commercial driver's licenses, and I and I understand that. Uh, do you have any information or any input that you could share with us as to whether or not uh, the federal government is neutral against or in favor of third-party testing for CDLs? Uh, Mr. Chairman, what I can tell you is that third-party CDL testing is allowed in other states, and it is being done successfully and safely. Okay, thank you, Mr. House Lane. Commissioner, I, I really think that, that we ought to dig into this a little bit deeper. Uh, and uh, I, I fully understand that your concern is the safety of the state of Minnesota and the people that are on the road, but uh, uh, ours is also. And uh, I really would appreciate it if, if you would uh, work with the legislature and the trucking association uh, and the various folks in the state of Minnesota that are being uh, being harmed by the inability to get their CDLs and their their proper testing done. So I, I look forward to working with you uh, on that, uh, Mr. You have my President. commitment that we will have that the Department of Public Safety and DVS will work with you on on doing that and and do it as in an expedited fashion. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, Senator Yuzinski, you've had your hat, uh, hand up for quite some time. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I think a couple things have been answered, but uh, again, uh, going back to the school bus third party testing, I was the author of that and I've heard nothing but uh, positive comments from my transportation operators here uh, in my district. They think that's phenomenal. It's really sped up the process. I made it much more easier as, as the comments have been made. 
Uh, when they found out uh, back a while it was taking so long, uh, they desperately needed bus drivers. And if they found out they had to wait for two to three weeks, they'd go to the marketplace somewhere else and somewhere else in the workforce. So it's been a great thing. I also introduced a bill for the uh, online knowledge test for the uh, first time drivers, and that did not pass this last session. But I guess my question is either to Commissioner Harrington, DPS or DVS. So on the CDL portion, uh, you are open to an online knowledge testing. Is that correct? What, what your statement was there, uh, Commissioner Harrington? Commissioner Harrington. You are muted, Mr. Uh, Commissioner. Sorry about that. There we go. Mr. Jasinski, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I'm certainly open to the conversation. Uh, I, don't, I don't have any reasons to uh, oppose it, uh, but I do want to make sure that uh, before I uh, commit uh, one way or another that we that I've looked at all the data and that there is no reasons to con be concerned around the public safety and the traffic safety issue. Senator, yeah, Mr. Chair, just just to follow up again as as the concern that I heard when I did the uh, first one for the uh, uh, 15 and 16 year olds or the 14 and 15 year olds, they, you know, they didn't think that was correct at that age level. But obviously, CDL uh, drivers are much older. Uh, would typically be older than that. I think they have to be 18. Uh, so I think that would be a good way to expedite that, to get things going, because obviously we've heard today there is a, a sense of urgency. So I would hope that you would support that. Again, I think the online, as I've said, I've been taking my online pilot's license uh, uh, knowledge portion online. So I think if, again, if I'll make the same analogy, if you can learn how to fly an airplane uh, online, you should be able to learn how to uh, uh, drive a commercial truck. So. Thank you. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Mr. Howe's uh is there other states, are you aware of other states or, or even Canada that allows third party CDL test, testing? Mr. Howe's uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Howe, yeah, we can get you a list of the states that are doing that, yes. So other states, uh, Senator uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Howe's there's, other states do this, and I don't know if Canada does it, but don't those other states' drivers come into Minnesota? Mr. Housewife. Yeah, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, CDL is essentially a, a national uh, license. You are issued it in your state of residence, and then, of course, you use it in, in any state, so it is recognized by the uh, credentialing and law enforcement in each state. Senator Health. Well, Commissioner Harrington, if, if that's the case, uh, and other states are having success in doing this, and their drivers are running in our on our roads, uh, why is it that we have an opposition to to allow our citizens that same opportunity to have that third party testing to get on the road and satisfy this this uh, shortage of uh, of truck drivers that we are currently facing? Commissioner Harrington. Senator Howe, Mr. Chair, uh, we're not in opposition. Uh, the opposition we had was to the younger drivers and the class D drivers having third party testing. Um, there has been political oppositions to CDL uh, and third party testing, but that has not come from, from my agency. And we are more than willing and interested in, in looking at what other states are doing this and how successful they are. And, um, and, and continuing this conversation with the legislature and with uh, the trucking industry to make sure that we are doing all that we can to make sure that we have uh, the driver's licenses can be issued in an expedited fashion, but that we are also doing it in a way that will make sure that Minnesota's roads are safe. Uh, that is kind of, those are the two variables that, that we have to keep in mind is crash rates and safety rates uh, are also something that we have to keep in mind uh, in addition to you know, trying to make sure that we do it as efficiently as possible. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, I am not seeing any other hands up. I'm gonna just pause for a second, but I don't see anybody else. Uh, with that, uh, oh, Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanna, I think when Commissioner Harrington just now uh, made a comment about as efficiently as possible. And I think generally that has been meant to be efficiently within DVS. But I think it's really important to think of efficiency also 
for our Minnesota drivers, whether it's by truck or bus or by car. Efficiency is about them as well, respecting their time, respecting their efforts, respecting their costs that are involved in this process. So I would like to just make sure that on behalf of Minnesotans out there, that efficiency includes them. And I think that will also help uh, the crunch. And But I think it's just uh, simply the right thing to do. And so I just want to be sure we talk about efficiency. It tends to be efficiency within DBS. Let's make sure that includes efficiency for Minnesotans as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, Commissioner Harrington, I'll give you an opportunity to respond if you wish. Um, Senator Kiffmeyer, Mr. Chair, I, I don't disagree with you. That's why the uh, Department of Vehicle Services and DPS has been working with the deputy registers and with a variety of other third party and private sector uh, vendors to make sure that we can get the, get the job done. Uh, so we're not opposed to that. Uh, uh, that. That is a change in a model that has been uh, had been the preferred model for a number of years. And we have made changes. Uh, we have made those changes as both technology has uh, continued to you know, uh, change and as the needs of the state have changed. And, and we're continuing to be willing to have that conversation uh, and to make those changes uh, just as we're working on kiosks and just as we've worked on computerizing the knowledge test, uh, we continue to do that work both uh, internally to DVS and DPS and also do it with our partners in the private sector. Thank you, Commissioner. And, and Commissioner, to you and your team, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time and joining us this afternoon. Uh, to those from the private sector, uh, thank you very much for coming in and providing us with uh, some insight as to the real world out there. Uh, sometimes we need a dose of that. Uh, we have, uh, we are now at just about uh, an hour and a half. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna adjourn the meeting. But again, thank you for all who joined us this afternoon. And uh, with a little luck, I hope we have learned something. So we are adjourned.